Hello, welcome to yet another session. Today we examine public relations. In our previous models, I looked at strategic calm as part of the menu of public relations and advertising, but today we look strictly at public relations. Public relations, in terms of its functions, involves a number of measures that are taken by companies and organizations to ensure that they're proactive in the sense that their contact with the public is engaged in, I would say, managing conflict, as well as making sure that there is as quickly as possible crisis communication that is accelerated so that the public has a very good impression or maintains a very good impression of that particular company. You would notice that I've assigned additional readings for you, the PRSA Code of Ethics, and of course, the Institute for Public Relations Statements on Ethics and public relations. They are both accessible on D2L well under your assigned readings. Now, public relations as it relates to the ethics module, in advertising, the main goal is really persuasion. And in about two modules back, I spoke about the fact that persuasion is embedded in advertising. And of course, advertisers think that we are and should be rational beings. And so many cases, in many instances, um, the argument is that consumers ought to know better. They ought to read the fine print. And so with advertising, because the main goal is persuasion, the information has a really strong secondary goal. And so the question is, where do public relations practitioners lie in the whole notion of ethical practice? Are they advocates? Are they information specialists? What ethical standards should apply to them? The PR essay code and the IPR both suggest that truth is central and remains central to the practice or practices of public relations practitioners. Now, let's look at a definition of public relations. It is a management function that establishes and maintains mutually beneficial relationships between organizations and the public on whom its success or failure depends. And I'd like to dwell here for a couple of seconds so that you know that PR, in every way, shape, or form, with all its positive intent, can go terribly wrong in some instances. A company can have a very good idea in terms of bringing the society together, but then there can be something that goes wrong in that message and the intention when it comes to the public feedback or outcry. And so public relations really involves both information and advocacy functions. But I'd like to share with you quickly how a PR campaign went terribly wrong a couple of years ago. So let's view this particular video together. All right, I think we will come back to that video. I think I've lost it for a moment, but I'd like to share it with you so that we can examine exactly what might have gone wrong in that particular context. I think I've got the video now, so we are going to examine it in the context of PR on Twitter. Right.
Now, just to give you some background behind that particular ad and what went terribly wrong, the ad was intended by Pepsi to spread the message of social cohesion and unity at a time when there was quite a lot happening in the country as it relates to the Black Lives Matter movement and how it had gained traction around the country and around the world. And that particular ad was made in 2017 when the Pepsi company launched a campaign called Live For Now Moments. And so it was built off a previous campaign that was launched in 2012, some years earlier. And so they used the supermodel who was felt to be an influencer and she was standing um, very close to the person who, you know, the police officer uh, who was guarding the protesters. And by giving him a can of Pepsi to take a sip, it really felt that the company felt that that was symbolizing some sort of common ground, but it was, it went, it was an ad went, that went terribly wrong in the sense that the public outcry against the notion of a unity of purpose really went against the grain of what the public felt was a trivializing of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so Pepsi had to um, fix that particular problem almost immediately um, by incorporating those figures who were against uh, the types of excesses or those figures who were involved in uh, protest actions before, such as MLK. And so they utilized some particular hashtag or a comment um, from his daughter saying, if only daddy would have known about the power of Pepsi. And so it really behoves those of us who are working in PR to understand exactly what is happening in the context of social outcry, what is happening in the context of um, an ad and the message and the resonance with the people before that message actually goes out there and it's misconstrued as the total opposite in terms of what is happening um, in its connection with uh, people and connecting to the intended audience. So public relations, as I said, it's really something that involves, it's an activity that involves both information and advocacy functions, but there is always a thin line that the public relations practitioner has to walk in terms of the awareness of the people as it relates to the sensitivity of the issue that you're seeking to bring light to. And so that was a definition. Now, if you've gone to the reading, you will see that ethics, um, as it relates to PR, ethics involve concepts of right and wrong, and PR ethics really involve values such as honesty, openness, loyalty, being fair-minded, having respect for those persons that you're targeting, having integrity and forthright communication, all right? So today's reading really questions whether ethics is possible in public relations, given its manipulative and propagandistic skills. So if there's a lot of propaganda, is it possible for a company then, then to be ethical? So what's the International Association of Business Communication telling us about what PR practitioners see as their role? And so based on a global study that was conducted just about five years ago, um, research on PR ethics to actually assess its management, um, what the scholars really found is the fact that um, a lot of what we're seeing as public relations in the context of practice, managers are involved in ethical adv adv advising at the highest levels of their organizations, and they're being heard at the highest levels of organizations. That's some of the good news that the report found. But on the downside, a majority of those who participated in that particular campaign in that study reported that they had very little, if any, academic training or study of ethics. So you're in a good place in the sense that you do understand and you're getting the foundation in terms of what the ethical principles and practice um, should be. But for those persons who were actually told, who were part of the study, they said they had very, very little training where the study of ethics was concerned. 30% of those polls said they had no academic ethics study of any kind. They had not really interacted with any study while another 40% of the practitioners said that they had few lectures or reading on ethics as shown in the particular pie chart that you can access here. So the pie chart is not here for you to see this study, but what it really reveals is a, it's a sense that um, there is really very little or limited, I would say, focus for those persons who would have gone into the PR field. They did not have the exposure, academically speaking, theoretical exposure, for the practice, so they did not necessarily, um, you know, they, they weren't aware of what to do in the context of the ethical principles of the profession. Um, the implication here is that a lot of them, 70% were 
ill-prepared, we could say that they were ill-prepared to face an ethical dilemma if they had no professional experience with ethics to support them. So it means that without that foundation, without that schooling, they would not know what to do in terms of a response to a crisis um, when it comes to handling the company on whose behalf they're actually conducting the PR exercises. Now, PR and advocacy, the advocacy function of PR is often very controversial. We know that a PR practitioner can be an advocate for a cause on behalf of a company, but some people actually equate advocacy with spin, meaning that they think that every single PR person puts a spin on the organization so that the organization looks good. And the assumption is that it's simply an effort to mislead the public. Now, very early public relations practitioners, you know, they defended the advocacy rule by using the time-honored philosophy of the marketplace of ideas. For those engaged in this marketplace of ideas, for them, it's about putting the information out there so that consumers or different people from a range of spaces and places can actually determine for themselves what is the truth and what's the, what, what, where the truth does not reside in the context of the marketplace of ideas. In this particular approach, all the ideas or types of information are welcome, even those that contain what we call slant in favor of that particular company. The assumption effectively here is that any misleading information put into the marketplace of ideas by anyone, such as a PR practitioner, would be self-corrected by the person who's reading the information. And of course, it will be corrected by the gatekeepers of the media and the public. So the ball is now being dropped in the courts of those persons who are media practitioners to grab the information and to correct it. And of course, the assumption is that consumers or those of us who are actually receiving the information, we are rational and we're able to dissect the truth coming from that PR slant. Now that is up for debate, but let's go to what the company's department puts out. If the company's department puts out a press release that contains false information, the argument is that either journalists will investigate the information and determine it to be false, or if the journalist fails to do so and the false information gets published, then members of the public will discover it on their own, that the information is false and they will make the facts known. We know this is not necessarily the case when it comes to the misinformation that was really peddled, particularly during the COVID um, pandemic when it was raging um, in, on, on the very, I would say in the wake of the pandemic, we did not necessarily have a whole lot of, I would say very good uh, ways and means of dissecting truth from falsehoods when it came to um, the particular um, you know, results of companies and stuff like that and, and the pandemic. So contemporary proponents of the advocacy role of PR, they argue that you know, this is even more likely today with the growing popularity of internet sites that investigates all types of information, meaning that PR companies will be advocacy types of companies, PR practitioners will advocate on behalf of their companies. And of course they have access to online sites to push that advocacy to the consumer, to the public. It's up to the public to understand and to underscore the truth and to be able to recognize the truth in the first place. But the problem is, does the marketplace of ideas approach imply that it is ethical for PR professionals to distort the truth or even lie to protect their employees? Now, a news item can contain pure facts and information designed to inform accurately and fully with no apparent bias. But for the PR practitioner, public relation often differs in terms of the intent of the pure facts. PR copy, advertising copy, and journalism editorials that have an intent to persuade, they use selective information. And so they're expected to present the truth, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, not the entire truth. The third step on the continuum of truth is fiction or an honest error. That is not the truth, but that has no intent to be seen. So the lies you know, in terms of, 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 of what it is we may find coming out um, with a PR practitioner, they may say, well, we did not intend to lie, but what we've given you is not the whole truth about the issue. And the question is, are lies told with an intent to be seen when it comes to the PR and the advocacy role on behalf of that company? 
Now, if we're measuring or we're actually comparing journalism alongside PR, journalism with the exception, exception of editorials, it is supposed to be limited to the first step on the continuum. All right, let's go back to the continuum. The continuum really says that really what you should be doing in journalism is presenting the truth um, at all times. All right. For the PR person, they're expected to present the truth, but maybe not the whole truth. Now, PR is really, you know, allowed to move to the second step, which is the information that they distribute should be true, but it doesn't have to be the entire matter in view of what the public is aware of. So the information that is detrimental to an organization can invariably be omitted from that press release that is sent out to the media house according to this particular approach that is actually given in the context of what a public relations practitioner can and cannot do in the context of ethical practices and principles. Now let's see what the Public Relations Society of America Professional Values and Guidelines state as it relates to the practice. Very, very high in terms of the scale of guidelines is the issue of values. And those values pertain to honesty, advocacy, loyalty, and fairness. You would recall a couple of weeks ago, we looked at those particular competing loyalties that journalists find themselves faced with. Now for the PR person, it is about really privileging honesty, being an advocate, being loyal to the company, and at the same time striving for some degree of fairness. As it relates to the code of conduct, every member of the society shall, and I quote, shall be honest and accurate in all communications and act promptly to correct erroneous communications for which the member is responsible. So honesty and accuracy are really hallmarks of the practice based on the code of conduct. And of course, being very credible in the sense that you're correcting errors and you're being authentic about those corrections. So I'd like for you to read through the entire PR essay code before addressing anything that has to do with not any discussion, we don't have a discussion, but anything that has to do with your own ethical code of conduct that you're developing for the end of the semester. Now, what about social responsibility and the PR professional? Two questions I'd like to raise are, to what extent should PR professionals be concerned with the effect of their actions on those outside of their specific publics? And another question, should short-term goals be sacrificed for the long-term context? These are questions that you will find in your text as well. And these are questions that you may ask yourself as you consider PR and social responsibility in your own realm in terms of what you intend to do as part of your future goals, professionally speaking. Now, social responsibility in a socially responsible model of PR, it is assumed that the long-term health of organizations is ill served by spin. And of course, it's better served by honest and timely communication, even at the expense of short-term losses. What this means effectively is that companies have found a way to make sure that they're winning over clients, they're winning over publics as a result of paying the brunt, as a result of putting themselves out there, as, as a result of actually giving the public something good to talk about, even though it's going to cost them, because for, for them in the long run, they're going to have what is called buy-in in the context of being socially responsible as a company or as an entity. So social responsibility is a cost benefit type of requirement. It's a cost benefit type of consideration that a lot of companies involve themselves in through PR to make sure that they're winning in the long run. If a company does something wrong, such as manufacture a faulty product or someone in the company leadership commits a crime, for those people who are involved in social responsibility, they think it's better to be honest about it, even if it reduces the profits in the short term because what they're seeing is that it will promote goodwill and an honest reputation in the long term. So quite a few companies get their hands dirty, they go out there and they're involved um, at the grassroots, you know, in, in, in the trenches with the people so that they're illustrating their particular, um, I would say, role in community engagement in development of the people of the grassroots at that particular level, so that they're saying, we're sorry that the products did not work out for you, but here's a chance for you to actually trust us once more. We're giving you the products for free. So that's an example of how they may say, you know what, we're going to lose this one. We're going to chalk it up as a loss, but in the end, we're going to regain our customer base and our brand 
so that in the long run, you're gaining rather than losing, all right? And there are some examples. I think this example with the rat fiasco with Whataburger, it's also a video that is available for you to see exactly what would have transpired and how customers and consumers ran from that company and what they did in, um, in response. So after the video went viral, the PR team briefly posted the following message on their Facebook page before quickly deleting it. They said, and I quote, we address this situation as quickly as possible, reinforcing processes with our family members. While we'll continue to be very diligent, it's important to know that there was no history of this type of incident at this unit and there is no ongoing issue. So what they did, they cleaned up quickly and they use language of reassurance to say to the customers, to their consumers, to their clients, you're safe with us. You know, this situation is under control and you, you no longer have to worry. It is okay to do business with us. So the PR person who is doing damage control has to be aware of where the client base is. Are they on social media? What are the channels that we are actually going to use to make sure that we are grabbing and holding the people to make sure that we are saving face, to make sure that we are doing damage control as quickly as possible so that in the long run, win rather than lose in the context of the functions of the PR person to be ethical and truthful as long and as, 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 as much as possible. Now, when it comes to social responsibility after the 9-11 attacks, the State Department funded a PR campaign organized by the Council on American Muslims Council of American Muslims for Understanding called CAMU. And the campaign was effectively run by Charlotte Beers to counter the US international image as being hostile to Muslims in the aftermath of the invasion of Afghanistan and later Iraq. And so they launched a website. Um, and I'd like for you to take a look at that particular website. We're not going to look at it together, but it's actually available there for you to have a look in terms of how they were able to manage the perspectives coming from other places in terms of the anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim um, treatment, the particular types of, um, I would say, stigma and discrimination that a lot of uh, Muslims um, who had come to the U.S. and had assimilated, the treatment that they were facing as a result of those notions of every single person who looked and who um, were actually, you know, from that particular religious group, they were seen or framed as perhaps terrorists. And so the campaign was really there and it was actually launched to make sure that there was no um, you know, particular repercussion baited out against those persons who were not um, you know, terrorists or belonged in any way, shape or form to a terrorist organization. So in today's case, in the case study, you will see that quit to blow the whistle or go with the flow. Um, the PI professional, Robert Wakefield, he faced a crisis of conscience while working for an urban school district. And the scenario here is really that he was asked by his boss, the superintendent to both flee the press and cover up school board actions regarding school closures. As the title of the case study suggests, Wakefield was faced with a decision to quit, blow the whistle on his boss or go along with the deception. I'd like you to think about those particular issues and questions that would have emerged in Wakefield's mind. Think about some of those issues that you may encounter as a PR practitioner, in terms of your duty or your fidelity to the company, and of course, your duty to tell the truth in the context of those particular codes of ethics as it relates to the public relations society of America.